So we've been speaking about faith for the last few weeks and why faith is so important is because the Bible says uh, without faith, we can't please God. And, and faith is so necessary for us to live a victorious Christian life. And the Lord always gives us a big dream and a big vision. And I'm sure he's given you a big dream and a big vision. But sometimes when he gives you that big dream and that big vision, attacks come your way. So today I want to share what do you do when attacks are coming your way? When your faith is under attack. So let's just uh, go to our key scripture. I'm not going to teach on it again, but it's Mark chapter 11, verse 22. Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. We know that to be the God kind of faith. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So four times Jesus himself is saying, speak to the mountain. Whoever says, those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Whatever things you ask, so four times. So it's so important as a Christian, as a believer, to speak to your mountain and ask the Lord to remove the mountain. And the Bible says, I say to you, whatever things you ask or ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So you don't have what you're asking for when you pray when it arrives. You receive it when you pray. You take ownership of it. You take ownership of that promise the Lord says to you, whatever he said to you. You're going to be a businessman. You're going to be a businesswoman. You're going to be a musician. You're going to be a, a teacher. You're going to be a principal. You're going to be a, a painter. You're going to be an artist. Believe that you receive that gift when you pray and it will manifest. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So in the natural, you may not see evidence that you're a great author or you're a great painter or you're a great singer, but if the Lord has spoken that dream and vision into your life, you're going to be a successful businessman, businesswoman. You're going to invent things. You're going to innovate things. But there's no evidence. Well, that's where faith is required. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's why the Bible says the just, Live by faith. So my first point is faith for what you are believing for must be based on the word of God. Now, you would think this is, you know, evident, but some people... I don't know where they pull things from. First Imaginations, chapter 7, verse 32. Don't come to me, pastor. You know, I've met this amazing woman. We've been working together for two years. I really feel she might be the one. But dude, you married. What are you talking about? Or oh, pastor, I've got this amazing idea for a casino in Las Vegas. I'm going to tithe. Listen, whatever you believe in for, trusting for, hoping for, whatever dreams and visions you're telling me God showed you must be founded on the word. While we were driving to tennis yesterday, he was speaking about uh, water baptism. You, you know, people that uh, they want to show that 
the religion. That, oh, I know some topics in, 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 in your field. And I said, you know, uh, and he was speaking about infant water baptism. And he said, what do you believe? I said, I believe what the Bible teaches. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it's not in the Bible, that's not the Lord's will. So show me in the Bible where infants have to be water baptized, and I'll believe it. So make sure whatever God, you believe God is showing you has to be based on his word. That's why it's so important for us as believers to know the word. That's why it's so important for us to teach our children and grandchildren and other people's children and even new believers the word of God so that Satan can't deceive. Deuteronomy chapter 5, 33, you shall walk in the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you that you may live and that it may be well for you and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord which you shall possess. So it's important for us to study the word. I know for some people it's difficult, especially if you're a busy person, but the Bible is encouraging us to know the ways of the Lord so that we won't be distracted, we won't be deceived. Deuteronomy 13 verses 4, you shall walk, after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. So a big emphasis on the word obey. We need to obey the voice of the Lord in order for our faith to work. So faith for what we are believing for must be based on the word of God. Number two, recognize that the source of your opposition is Satan. Now, Satan uses his children to come against us. So people may use and abuse you. People may deceive you. People may lay traps. People may gossip about you. People may slander your name. But ultimately, the person behind it is the devil. And he is using his children, those that are not in covenant with God, to come against us. And sometimes, oy vey, sometimes even Christians may be those kinds of people that come against us. I, I used to think Christians were perfect. When I first got saved, I honestly thought, wow, I'm in this new situation, this kingdom of God, church, people are raising their hands, singing praises to Jesus. They're praying in this heavenly language. They're smiling. But when you really think about it, all the knives in your back that you've had to pull out or, or all the, the chaos, much of the time it's fellow Christians. And that's what hurts the most, when fellow Christians betray us, when fellow Christians let us down. But ultimately, we must know that God has a calling on our life and that opposition is coming from the enemy because he wants us to walk in unforgiveness. He wants us to walk in the natural. He wants us to get upset. So knowing who your opposition is, is so important. And you know your weaknesses. In tennis, I know my weaknesses. I don't want the opposition to know my weakness because then he's going to target my weakness. So in life, it's good for us to know our weaknesses. And let me tell you, and don't look at me religiously, we all have weaknesses. One of my weaknesses is impatience or, or irritability. 
Do any of you ever get irritated? Never, never, never. Pastor, what are you talking about? Do you get irritated? Let me tell you, my next door neighbor, the Lord, the devil knows how to target me, right? The next door neighbor, it's a single mother. The devil really used her. She bought a piano, and now they're teaching the four-year-old child how to play piano, and it's like Chinese water torture every day. With the, with, because my office window, I work from home, the downstairs room is the office. It's here, and we, and then that window is probably just before the speaker, and it's like, and uh, listen, this kid's gonna be. Uh, I'm like, this kid's gonna be a concert pianist because the four-year-old is practicing like six hours a day. But the first year practicing six hours a day is torture for me. So needless to say, I've had a few words with the neighbor. And the neighbor doesn't see it from my point of view. And I'm like, listen, if it was once a week for an hour, acceptable. But six hours a day, the different times of the day, throughout the day, some, I mean, the other day until 7.30 at night. I'm like... I don't know whether to sign this kid to be his manager or, 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 or I don't know what I'm going to do. So I need to realize that the source of the opposition is the devil. So he's going to look, are you easily offended? Are you easily irritated? Uh, what is your weakness? And he's going to target that weakness so that we can get out of faith believing for what we believe in for. So it's a distraction. I'm praying that some person gives them an amazing offer on their house. They were talking a year ago about moving. I'm like, Lord, please. Let them move to Texas and where, where they could uh, buy 10 houses for what Orange County houses are, right? Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and to destroy I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. So God is a good God. Jesus is a good God. The devil is a bad devil. So any opposition is not God directing it your way. It's the devil that is coming against you. Now, sometimes the Lord will use that opposition to build character in you because resistant, uh, 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 Growth comes from resistance. So I'm trying, I'm, I'm struggling, but I'm trying to, Lord, are you trying to teach me long suffering, maybe? Patience with the little pianist next door? 2 Corinthians 4 verses 4 says, whose minds, this is our minds, the God of this age, that's the devil, has blinded who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So the battle often is in the mind. You, you see it with sport. I think we can all agree with sport. The top guys in whatever sport, and yes, there are some mavericks out there, but they're pretty much all the same as far as th their level is pretty much the same. But it's often guys with the very strong mental ability is the one that always seems to win. So like I told you last Sunday, please don't tell me who won Wimbledon. You want to know? Novak Djokovic won Wimbledon. But he played a guy from Australia who needs Jesus badly. He badly, badly needs Jesus. Because this guy, literally, when he loses a point, he screams at, his, uh, at the player's box. So you know you've got the player's box? 
Next to the players' box is the prince and princess of England. The most famous celebrities, but this guy loses it. So he literally screams, why aren't you clapping for me? Why aren't you standing up clapping for me? I mean, he, he loses it mentally. Like literally every point. It's so embarrassing. It's so demeaning. Seriously, for, for it's his dad, his girlfriend, his friends. And he does it in almost every match. And it upsets all the players that he plays against. And Tsitsipas was the only one with enough guts to say, listen, what he's doing is wrong. We're here to play tennis. And every point, he's screaming and shouting, ranting and raving. And what he, he's doing it because he is a nutcase, but he's also doing it to irritate his opponents. And they get irritated with the guy. Some of them, like, confront him during the match. And the uh, umpires have to, like, like, not pull them apart, but don't speak to him, I'll speak to him. But it's amazing that Novak Djokovic is so mentally strong. It didn't upset him once. And you could see this guy, I don't want to mention his name, but he, he, he was trying to rattle Djokovic. Djokovic was so mentally strong. Last year, one of the, the, the ladies interviewed Djokovic after the match, and, and she thought he was joking, but he was like 100% serious because he grew up in Serbia, and there was war and, and bombs falling, and, I mean, he saw the war. He experienced it. They had to hide in the mountains. I mean, it was serious war when, when he was a little boy. So he won this match, <laughs> and this showed me a year ago, this guy's on a different level, like mentally, you know? She said, wow, Novak, like in, in a beautiful British accent, I can't even imitate it. Wow, you really played so well. How did you do it? And then he looked at her, like totally serious. He says, I grew up in the mountains with the wolves. <laughs> and she started laughing. And like as serious can be, he said, I'm not joking. He was like... <laughs> And that showed me, no, this guy's on a different mental level. And I really saw it last Sunday. He was so calm. He was, and it was incredible. And that's what the devil wants to do with us. He wants to rattle us with noise, with threats of fear, the economy, gas prices. Your boss, your husband, your wife, your girlfriend, your mother, your father, your sister-in-law, your father-in-law, there's all this chaos, all this screaming. It's to unrattle you, to get you out of faith. To get you out of trusting in God that he will do what he said he would do when you were a little boy, little girl, adolescent, adult. God promised you something and maybe it hasn't manifested and it's going to manifest as long as you stand and, and in faith. And keep your eyes on Jesus and don't get distracted. Don't get distracted. Mark 4, 35, on the same day that when the evening had come, he said to them, that's Jesus, let's cross over to the other side. Now, when they left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And the other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose. Why aren't you clapping for me? Why aren't you standing? He's trying to upset Djokovic. He's trying to rattle him, get him out of focusing on the task at hand. The task at hand is to win Wimbledon. Your task at hand is to complete your assignment. But there's all this noise, all this distraction. There's a windstorm. And the waves began to beat on the boat so that it was filling up. But Jesus was in the stern asleep on a pillow. Jesus was relaxed. In the midst of the storm, he was calm. 
And they woke him up and they said, teacher, don't you care that we die and that we perish in? Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was great calm. And he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who, the, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? In your work, in your community, in your circle of friends, when you are the calm one in the midst of the storm, people are going to say, like, who are you? Are you an alien? Are you, are you, where are you from? How are you so calm? A very good friend of mine, uh, Saadi, his wife passed away about 10 days ago. She had cancer. She went for treatment. They're people of faith, very strong Christians in the ministry. But she passed away. And when I spoke to him, he said, Jared, you wouldn't believe the peace that I'm experiencing. It's like a supernatural peace. And I'm going to see her again in heaven one day. But I have this incredible peace. So God, our Father, will give you peace in the storm. Everyone else will be experiencing the turbulence, but you will experience so much peace. Number three, take responsibility for your actions. We're speaking about what do you do when your faith is under attack. Sometimes we open the door for the attack. Sometimes we let the Trojan horse into our house, into our city, into our lives, and we wonder why there's all this turmoil. So that's where we have to take responsibility for our actions. James 1.13, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God, for no one can be, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So those temptations that are coming are not coming from the Lord. They're coming from the enemy, the evil one, Satan. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. That's why it's so good to know your weaknesses so that you don't put yourself in a situation where you can mess up. So if you used to struggle with uh, drinking, and getting drunk, and when you drink and you get drunk and you lose your, your mind, you do crazy stuff, then when they invite you to a bar after work, don't go. <laughs> I really got to get home. My wife, oh, she's expecting me. You got to get out of that situation. Now, don't lie if your wife didn't say that. I'm just saying... Find an excuse. I got to be somewhere. Yeah, not there. <laughs> I'd love to go, guys, but I'm going to be late for an appointment. Yeah, an appointment with Jesus, doing a Bible study. Just quickly in your mind, make up an appointment. Get out of that situation. Galatians 6 verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he reap. For he sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he sows to the spirit, of the spirit reap everlasting life. So sowing works positively and negatively. If we sow bad seed, we're going to get bad harvest. If we sow good seed, we're going to get a good harvest. So always make sure that you sow in good seed. Sometimes that seed takes a few months. Sometimes that seed takes a few years to manifest. Like I, I've shared with you, and I, I won't go into a big testimony, you all know it, but in 2008, when I was in Cape Town, South Africa, the Lord said, one day I'm going to give you a farm, a ranch. And Save the World Foundation will be on the ranch and the teams will be there and 
big things, world evangelism is going to come out of this farm, this ranch. It's going to be like evangelism world headquarters. So what did I have to do? I had to stay, stay in faith. Stand in faith. I had to keep sowing. I had to keep speaking faith. Like I told you, every year, sometimes twice a year, I would tell the team, the Lord's going to give us a ranch. The Lord's going to give us a ranch. They probably thought pastors lost it. It's been 14 years. He's still telling us God's going to give us a ranch. And I would joke every time I go to South Africa, they probably say, listen, pastor's going to go on about this ranch, act excited, look excited, to say wow a lot, amazing. Okay, you say wow, you say amazing, you say awesome, you say praise the Lord, uh, you say the Lord's going to do it. Okay, are we all on the same page? Okay, here he comes. He's not even going to greet us. We haven't seen him in eight months. He's going to walk in. He's going to tell us that God's going to give us a ranch. Act excited. Great. Guys, you know what? I'm telling you, the Lord's going to. And then a few months ago, I get the phone call. One partner of Save the World Foundation is going to buy us a ranch. I speak to him a few times a week. He's allocated $2 million. He said to me, the money is sitting in an account. Tell me when you find the ranch, I'm ready to buy the ranch for you. So sometimes God will give you a dream. He'll give you a vision. One year goes by. Two years go by. Uh, I don't know if the Lord was in it. Three years go by. Four years go by. If the Lord told you you're going to be a millionaire, you're going to own your own business, you're going to be an inventor, you're going to be a real estate developer. You're going to own lots of houses and put lots of tenants in and have all this passive income. Stay in faith and believe it and keep confessing it, keep speaking it, keep trusting in the Lord. So let's just say we've been messing up. That's, that's where 1 John 1, 1.9 comes in. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So thank God for the blood of Jesus because even if you mess up, it doesn't mean that that promise is canceled, that, that now you have to start from scratch. It means that you... You confess to the Lord, Lord, sorry I've been losing it with my wife, with my next door neighbor. Sorry I, I, I did whatever. I, and get on track with the Lord again. Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. So confess your sins to the Lord. It's not like, when you tell him it's the first time he's finding out. I can't believe it. Did you really do that? No, he was there when you were doing it. But he's put that clause into the contract, confess your sins, and he's faithful and just to forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Acts 3.19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, so that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. We all need times of refreshing. We all need to be refreshed. Revelation 3.19, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. So if you feel the rebuke of the Lord, the conviction of the Lord, that's a good thing. That means he loves you. We, listen, and I rebuke our kids all the time. And we tell them, don't do it. This is why you mustn't do it. We love you. We don't want you to make bad decisions. So when the Lord corrects you and when even good friends correct you, don't get offended. If you had to say, Jared, what is the one thing about Christians that you've noticed since you've been a Christian? 
I'd say, like, if I had to really narrow it down to one thing, Christians are so easily offended. We need to have thick skin. People have left our church over the most ridiculous things. Being offended by what one brother or sister said to them in a connect group or in church, or it's like, don't be a snowflake. <laughs> we mustn't be snowflakes. I heard this, this one man, he's a business guy in his 70s. He said, stop being snowflakes. The person, what's a snowflake? A snowflake is someone who melts under pressure. We, we mustn't be snowflakes. We, we, must be, we must be like asbestos Christians. Is that the right word? When the fire comes, it doesn't penetrate you? Where, where some people, a little bit of heat, <laughs> I have to leave this church. Come on, guys, let's toughen up. Let's be Navy SEALs for Jesus. Navy SEALs, not, not snowflakes. We should actually come up with a T-shirt. Are you a snowflake for Jesus or a Navy SEAL for Jesus? I want to be a Navy SEAL for Jesus. Point number four, submit to God and resist the devil. We're talking about how do we come against those attacks by the devil? How do we stay in faith? Submit to God, resist the devil. James 4, 17, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So the first thing we need to do is submit to God. Lord, I submit to your word. Whatever your word says, I'm going to do. Whatever they teach me in church or connect group, I'm going to do as long as what they're preaching is in the word of God. I'm here to learn. I'm here to grow. I'm here to submit to your kingdom. You see, when you become a believer in, in Jesus, you come into a new kingdom, but new, there's a new set of rules. There's a new sheriff in town in your heart, and he has good rules. Rules? Ooh, ooh, I don't like rules. Well, imagine a football game without rules. Imagine an NBA game without lines, without rules. You wouldn't enjoy it. God's rules are there to bless you. God's rules are there to prosper you. God's rules, his laws are there to protect you. The word submit means to accept or yield to a superior force or authority. And resist, what does resist mean? To withstand the action or effect of, to come against or stand against an enemy, to resist spoilage, to refrain or abstain from, especially with difficulty or reluctance. So we submit to God and we resist the devil. We don't accept the things that the devil wants to do to us. He wants you to be broke, busted, and disgusted, sick and diseased, tormented. Be depressed, be anxious, be <gasps> distraught. That's what he wants for you. So when those feelings come, you need to resist him. Satan, I resist you. You resist him with your words. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. I rebuke your attack on my marriage. I rebuke your attack on my finances. I rebuke your attack on my children, on my wife, on my health, on my wealth. I resist you in Jesus' name. That's how you do it, guys. I'm teaching you. So we submit to God. Lord, I submit to you, to your rule and reign in my life. Now, Satan, I resist you. Take your hands off my money in Jesus' name. Take your hands off my investments. 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. So we are in a fight. It's a good fight. We win 
if we do the Lord's word, which is submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. And we spoke about sowing good things. When you have good seed in the ground, you're going to reap a good harvest. If you've sown bad seed, say, Lord, I cancel that bad seed in Jesus' name. Forgive me for how I've treated my colleagues. Forgive me how I've done this. Forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. And then you position yourself. And then the final thing I want to teach, it will be very quick, is stand your ground. Say, stand my ground. This is what to do when your faith is under attack. The final thing, stand your ground. Ephesians 6, 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we re wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having all done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So we have on the breastplate of righteousness because of what Jesus did having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking up the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, take up the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And I finish with this illustration. I heard uh, Kenneth Hagin share this great illustration. He said in the 1930s, there was an Air Force base and they were doing some construction and they didn't have cranes and whatever on this base. So there was this long metal um, beam that they had to pull up for the building or whatever they were doing. And they had about a hundred soldiers with the ropes pulling and pulling and hoisting this still thing up. Something happened, who knows what happened. But uh, the thing started coming down. I may, obviously it was too heavy, they couldn't like hold on. So people started like letting go. Of the hundred, they started letting go, but some people still held on. And it actually lifted them dozens of feet in the, in, in the ground and as they were going up, they just quickly like let go. And women were screaming, literally fainting. Children were screaming. Men were like people were hiding their faces. And as people were dropping, breaking their legs and whatever, one guy shot up all the way. And uh, they said he was like a little toy soldier. He was so high up. And they try to get ambulances and the fire and to try and get up to the guy. Eventually, they got up to that guy. He was an hour in, in, in the air. An hour. And when, he, when they got him down, they said, how, how on earth did you manage to hold on to the rope? He said, let me tell you what happened. As I, we started shooting up, I, I saw what was going to happen and I took the rope because I had slack on the rope and I wrapped the rope around me. I wasn't holding on to the rope. The rope was holding on to me. The rope was holding him up. God's word will hold you up. God's word will take you to the top. God's word will ensure that you become the success that is destined you to be. You are not an accident, you're not a mistake, you're not a failure. Even if you've messed up a hundred times, God created you to be a success. You are created in the image of God. How beautiful are you? Say, I am beautiful.
I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God has a plan for my life. I am born to do great things. And I will accomplish all He's called me to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. With Jesus on our side, we cannot lose. It's a rigged game. We win. Read the back of the book. Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. Lord, just give me two minutes with him before you throw him in that lake. <laughs> I think we all deserve at least one slap in the face or kick or something. Give me a bazooka, Lord. Satan, open wide. But we win. We spend eternity in heaven. And the Bible says, Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, how powerful are you? How victorious are you? How much joy do you have in heaven? Lord, let that same situation in heaven be here on earth. Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven... Tick, 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 tick. So on earth, you can have tick, 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 tick as well. Amen. Father God, thank you for your precious word. Thank you, Lord, that we know what to do when we're under attack. We now know. So when that attack comes, we will be victorious, Lord. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here today those that are watching us, listening to us. I pray, Father, that your perfect will is done in their lives. That dream, that vision that you've put in their heart, that you've sealed in heaven, I pray that it will be accomplished in Jesus' name. I thank you that every single one hearing my voice will fulfill their destiny will fulfill the assignment that they have. Knowing that they don't have to do it on their own, you are with us as individuals and as a group. You are with us. You are the one who we've wrapped our hope around, who we've given our hearts to, who we've dedicated ourselves to. And we will stand in faith till the end, till we meet you, Lord, face to face. In Jesus' name.